had a bit of a struggle with my, my voice of late. Oh. <sighs> yeah. It's actually been a week of celebrations, so please forgive me. I'll leave that there. All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you don't mind. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's a bit fun. But um, it's a wonderful blessing, wonderful blessing to, uh, to be able to bring the Word of God to you this morning. And a wonderful blessing, especially when I give consideration to the topic that we have this morning. And it's an interesting one, and it should fascinate each of us to one degree or another. We've been dealing with the Holy Spirit. As we've been going through the Statement of Faith, a Statement of Faith is a document that illustrates the core belief of a church. And every church should have a statement of faith. That is, every church that desires to be transparent should have a statement of faith. Um, The more transparent the church desires to be, the clearer the statement of faith should be expressed. Uh, The less transparent a church desires to be, well, the less the statement of faith will um, demonstrate what they believe. And those churches that don't have a statement of faith you've got to wonder if they believe anything at all. Um, so it's a, it's a big question. We've spent time dealing with God the Father and then God the Son and now we are up to the third message of the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And what we would look to bring out today is how God the Holy Spirit manifests Himself through Christians to the world. Now when I say Christians, I need to qualify that as well because <coughs> these days... Everybody calls themselves a Christian. There's all these people that call themselves Christian, but they're not Christians. I'm, when I'm referring to Christians, I'm speaking about those who are born-again believers. They are those that have believed the gospel that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Those are the ones that I'm referring to. They are the same ones that recognise that he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, as we see in 1 John 5.12. They believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. They believe in their heart that we, like sheep, have gone astray. Everyone has turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the Old Testament version of John 3.16, found in Isaiah 53.6. These are those who are born again. These are those who are saved. These are those, and these are only those who are indeed Christians. Christianity as well is not something that is based on the beliefs of those who call themselves Christians. It's important to distinguish that too. It's amazing how confused things have become over all these years. You know, we often judge Christianity by the beliefs held by those that call themselves Christians. And I think it was John Robbins, the late John Robbins, who I believe actually gave a really good expression of Christianity. He said, Christianity is what the Bible teaches. Christianity is not the beliefs held by those who call themselves Christian. And I think that's a reasonable definition in that regard short but Christianity is indeed what the Bible teaches. So they are not those who go to church every Sunday, Christians. Um, they are not those who do good deeds most of the time. They are good. Uh, they are not those who grow up in a certain tradition or a certain nationality or in a certain family. Uh, there is no such thing as a Christian country and there has never been such a thing as Christendom, at least not in a physical sense, at least not in a physical sense. The Christian is an individual who has believed in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's really that simple. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I've got a little trip point here. Um, So the question for us is how then, when we're talking about the Spirit of God... The title of the message this morning is The Manifestation of the Spirit. How then should we expect the Spirit of God Himself to manifest Himself? 
How does he reveal himself? What are one of the ways that he shows himself? And we had a look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 12. I just want to read from verse 3 of that passage again. He says there, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. An interesting, uh, an interesting prospect of the Trinity sort of mentioned there. The Spirit and the Lord and God, all of them working the same thing, all in all. But then he goes on, he says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another is given, to another is given, to another is given, to another is given, and it goes on you see this is a passage that speaks about the distribution of gifts. Here we see in that way the manifestation of the Spirit. He's giving a distribution of gifts to all people. But, but what does that mean? How in essence is the Spirit of God actually manifesting Himself? We recognise that these are gifts, these are things that administrations and um, abilities that people didn't have naturally. They were given those gifts. Everyone who is born again is given those gifts by the Spirit of God for a purpose. There's one. There's primarily one manifestation of the Spirit that, however, they all have in common. And it is first understood by the very purpose of the gifts. By the very purpose of the gifts. What we're looking for here is how the Spirit of God manifests Himself. And you all know the answer. And, but it's demonstrated through the spreading of these gifts and their purpose. It's first understood by the purpose of the gifts, and yet we're told in clear terms that the greatest underlying way that the Spirit of God manifests Himself to in believers, through believers. Is anybody, could anybody have a hazard a guess before I move any for, further forward? How does the Spirit of God actually manifest Himself through believers to the world? It's one word. All right, okay, I'll go on. You'll get it, you'll get it. The last time we looked at the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to do what? Anybody remember? It's to glorify Jesus, right? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of the Comforter that would come and He said, He shall glorify me. He shall not speak of Himself, that He shall glorify me. His ultimate purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Think of what God is. Think of how Jesus Christ manifested what He did on that cross for you and I. What was the underlying motivating factor in that effort? What is it? I heard someone say, love, love, indeed love. And it is what Paul refers to with regards to the Spirit of God as the more excellent way. Have a look in your Bibles there in 1 Corinthians 12. We're still in the passage in chapter 12, but we're going to read it from verse 31. Because ultimately, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you this morning is that the ultimate manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life is love. And not just any love. It's a peculiar love. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. But it's a peculiar love between brethren. Between brethren. And you may not have ever seen this before. You may have. You may have if you've actually ever studied out this particular word, charity, that we see in chapter 13. But have a look at it with me. Paul is dealing with the the Corinthian church and we recognise he's dealing with an exaggerated use of a particular gift And he puts that in a certain list, and we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end. But he says there in verse 31, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and of not charity, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. 
Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Beloved, the greatest single manifestation of the Spirit of God shed abroad in the hearts of those who are saved is the love identified as Christian charity, the peculiar love between brethren that identifies Christ to the world. Turn your Bibles to John, Gospel of John in chapter 13. And hear it directly from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. John, in chapter 13. Two verses there, verses 34 and 35. Jesus speaking, saying, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It's curious because when you actually look at the word charity and, and, you know, and if you were going to be looking at it in the Greek language, you'd actually find that it's just the word agape. And the word agape is love we recognize that and it's found in many portions of the new testament but why is it here translated as charity why is the word changed we understand in the english language as well as every other language that you can have one word and it can mean a number of different things and context always bears witness to that we never ever in the english language translate the same word in every time we use it. We just don't do that. Context tells you what it refers to. You can use the word down in so many different ways. You can use the word bear in so many different ways. There are a multitude of ways that we can use different words. Context bears witness to it. So I challenge you, do yourself a simple service and, you know, use your little search on your your phone or on your computer or grab yourself a concordance and have a look at the word charity and see how it's used in the New Testament. And you discover something that I discovered and that is that it's only ever used as an expression of love between brethren, which I found really strange. I found that very strange. I found that very curious because I wanted to know why charity? Why did the translators choose a different word here? Why did they not use the same word that we see in the Greek? Well, the Greek would have understood that this is a love between brethren and that is something we don't understand until we see the change in the word. This is a very peculiar love. For far too many Christians have forgotten the incredible work of the Spirit of God that it's been done within their lives. Too many have been caught up with a lot of distractions and they spend little to no time in their Bibles nor time with the Lord in prayer and therefore fail to exercise that love between brethren particularly and as a result of that we see divisions in churches we just wrote read about that this morning in the chapter just prior to this one in chapter 11 and Paul's saying I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it you know one of the reasons that occurs is because of a lack of charity a lack of love between brethren and and you would often call us Charity as love in action is somehow, is a way that other people have referred to it as. Charity is love in action. It's not just love for love's sake. It's not just a feeling. It's love in, in action. Now, too many these days, however, are given over to ego. They are given over to envy. They are given over to sin in their own lives. They do not share the hope of Christ. And so, like the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, they have lost their first love. John wrote, saying this in 1 John 4, If any man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Well, that's incredible. That's, that's a powerful passage, that one. It strikes of reality. 
and this is the commandment, and this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. If we say that we love God, but we hate our brother, how, how does that make any sense? We've seen our brother, but we don't love him. We haven't seen God and we love him. That doesn't work. You know, this is clear how this is being brought together in the passage. The passage in, that we're dealing with here, and we're not dealing with the whole passage, and I'm only dealing with one element, and it is the manifestation of the Spirit of God, but it encompasses that entire portion of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. In that portion, Paul is dealing with an exaggerated use of a particular gift. And you'll be able to identify it when you go through it yourselves. But he is dealing with the exaggerated and incorrect use of the gift of, anybody know? Tongues. The gift of tongues. And it's amazing how it's actually received such prominence today when Paul is actually dealing with it in a rebuking fashion in three chapters. He puts it in three lists. Two of those lists, he lists at last. And then he wants to highlight it as compared to love, he lists it first. You notice that in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I have the tongues of angels, yet I have not love. So it's clearly highlighting it. So in that portion, he's dealing with that particular manifestation. Similar manifestation that's happening here was happening in the worldly church of Corinth at that time. But in that is also embedded this wonderful truth, the manifestation of the Spirit of God and how that Spirit is manifested in the lives of each of us. And that is through love. So the first we have is to every man. But before we do so, I know that was a lengthy introduction. Um, the sermon won't go any longer than usual, so I praise you for your grace. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful blessing to us. We thank you for your goodness and your work. And I thank you, dear Lord, that the Spirit of God is shed abroad within our own hearts. And I pray, dear Lord, that the love that we have one toward another would be that which is a particular gift given to us that expresses Jesus Christ, that reveals Jesus Christ, that shows Jesus Christ to all the world. The love that we have one for another should be that love that is demonstrated to the world. I pray, dear Lord, you'll be a blessing to us as I try and demonstrate this this morning. Convict our hearts, dear Father, also for our own shortcomings. For in us, dear Lord, there are indeed many. We are in every way but flesh. And yet, Father, we have the Spirit of God within. Help us manifest Him faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first is to every man that the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, not just one, not just another, uh, but every man, by every man, obviously every man who is born again. We consider the nature given to every man, I wanted to focus here on what it means, the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit given to every man. It is the most incredible transformation in history when the gospel is believed and an individual is born again. There is a, a change, a transformation that happens within their lives. They are completely and totally changed. Naturally, we all heard the truth of the gospel before we believed. We heard that we are sinners, that we have offended a holy and righteous God who created us in His own image, that He created us to have relationship with Him. He created us to have relationship with Him. I mean, think about that. He created us to have relationship with Him but our sin against Him has separated us from Him. And this isn't unusual, and this shouldn't strike you as unusual. But how many friends are you going to be hanging around with that continue to sin against you exactly? How many of you enjoy their company? You enjoy their company? They don't like you, they sin against you, they spit in your face, they swear at you, they use your name as a swear word. You're going to want to hang around them at all? You want a relationship with people like that? Even those that you don't agree with, do you find it easy to be sharing a relationship with them? I mean, can two walk together except they be agreed? It says in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, two cannot walk together except they be agreed. agreed. Not for long, that's for certain. They find themselves not being able to tolerate the presence of one another and separation 
is assured. This is exactly the same thing that's happened between us and God in the natural state. We've sinned against God, God's created us for a relationship with Him, but our sin against Him separates us from Him. It's natural in our lives, it's natural in the relationship that we have to God, exactly the same, it's exactly the same. The relationship between us and God is broken by sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin, it's a fascinating phrase, seems to set the appropriate penalty rate. Interesting phrase. A penalty rate that's been received as the reward of our own iniquity. Man was created for a purpose and naturally is accountable to that purpose. It's one of the reasons why fallen man today doesn't want to believe that the entire creation was created by God. You'd you'd think that with all the evidence that they have before their eyes, they would believe that some God created all of these things because it has evidence of design. They don't have to go to the Bible. They don't need to necessarily accept a Christian view. They can receive the deist idea that God has simply just created everything, got it in motion and just been sitting back watching the progress ever since. But you see, they're not that silly because they recognise that if God has created anything, He's created it for a purpose. How many of you make things for a purpose? You make something and men, men, you're often found in the shed, you know, making something and I guess it certainly does, you know, makes a tool to actually fit a tool and to work a particular end. But tell me something, if you've made something for a very specific purpose and it doesn't function according to the purpose for which you created it, is it any good to you? It's not good to you. Throw in the bin. Start again with something else. But the unique thing here is that for us as people, we only find our lives fulfilled when we are living according to the purpose for which God created us. Isn't that curious? We find our lives completely empty otherwise. We might reach the top of our career, we might go out and we might make a lot of money and we might start businesses and this and that and the other, but it's all for self. And what we discover is what is true and that is we can't keep doing things for ourselves all the time because we weren't created to live for ourselves. We were created for the purpose of God. It's His purpose that we are to live for. So you will never... Beloved, I'm I'm afraid to tell you, you will never, ever, ever find satisfaction living a life that has its purpose antithetical to that for which you've been created. You were created to live according to a purpose. And in this passage, we're seeing that you've been been given gifts to fulfill that purpose. What a wonderful blessing that is. It's not from you, it's from Him. It's given by the Lord. Now, the Spirit of God is given, therefore, to every man who believed the gospel, every man who heard of their sin and the judgment to come, every man who understood he would face eternal ruin as a just recompense of a life lived in opposition to the purpose of his Creator. Every man who believed Jesus died specifically for him, God now gives his own Spirit to him. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, every man. The person who is born of the Spirit is now a new creature, we are told in 2 Corinthians 5.17. A changed person and the manifestation of the Spirit should be evident in him. It should be evident in him. The previous message on the Holy Spirit told us that the Spirit's purpose was to glorify the Son. Does it not stand to reason that that's now ours? If we have the Spirit of God in us and the manifestation of that Spirit is to work the work of God, isn't it to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? You'll often see preachers who fill their sermons with I, 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 but it ain't anything about them. The Gospel is about the Lord Jesus Christ and it's His name that needs to present in every single message. This is the love, the greatest manifestation of the Spirit of God is given to every man to profit with all. Next point, to profit with all. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit 
with all. Beloved, the passage before us speaks of the distribution of spiritual gifts given to, again, every man, every man who is born again. The gifts are the same manifestation of the Spirit. It has as its purpose that end. Whatever your gifts are, whatever your calling is, it is to manifest the Spirit of God, the love of God, especially to your brethren. We see that in the passage. The ultimate benefit of those gifts given to every man, however, is to profit with all. With all. That's interesting. To profit with all. So, that's both, per, both, per, both personal and public. It's not just personal. It's not just public. It's both personal and public. We actually see a hint of that in the text. It is both to the one to whom the gifts are given and to those who are the beneficiaries of the expression of those gifts. The one who has been given the gift, however, also has the responsibility to faithfully express it. So, I've been given a gift and I profit when I exercise that gift faithfully. I profit, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. And how do I profit? Well, you profit in, in at least joy. When, I know, I understand many people go to work today and they just do it as a J-O-B, right? They go there, they clock on, clock off, go home and, you know, that's their day done because in the end, their ultimate purpose is to bring home the bacon to the family, right? Um, but they don't necessarily find satisfaction in their jobs because they, they f- find it unfulfilling. Some are blessed with fulfilling work, work that they do that they actually find themselves uh, fulfilling a purpose. They're, they use it in philosophical terms, it's called meaning-making. That's the reason why people who hold a stop sign, which any computer can do, and flip it this way and then flip it back that way and they spend the entire day standing there with a stop sign. It's the reason they get paid the big bucks because there ain't no meaning making in that. They know it intuitively. Those who have government jobs that are only shuffling paper from here to here feel exactly the same way. They don't feel like they're doing anything of value in that respect. It's interesting how those who are doing things of immense value get paid so little. Why? Because they love doing what they do. You don't have to pay them as much because they love doing it. They do it for free. They do it for free. And indeed, many do. Many do. So we recognize intuitively that when we express the things of the Spirit of God and we do so faithfully, we get joy and blessing out of it. But also because we profit others. We profit with all. We profit ourselves and we profit those who are the beneficiaries of the work. When you're gainfully employed, you profit. When your employer receives the benefit of the faithfulness with which you do and undertake all the work. You exercise your talents for his purpose and you also profit because you are remunerated generally accordingly. You might receive also public acknowledgement, you might have an increase in remuneration, you might get a pay rise, Uh, you might have an increase in clientele if you're a business person or you might simply be the last one to lose their job when times get tough. I had that in my own business in construction and I expressed that to the individuals who worked for me and I said to them, your ultimate purpose is to be profitable to me. It might sound vain to you, you might think that you have a right to earning the amount of money that you might earn, nevertheless that's not how the market works and when the market dies down, the first ones that will go are the ones who are least profitable. The last person that I would let go of will be the one who is most profitable to my business. Does that make sense to you guys? I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not illogical, you know? I mean, that's clear. That's how, that's how real life works. So this is the truth of this. When you are profitable to your employer, and I'm trying to make you really good employees here, <laughs> right? I'm trying to encourage you. Be good employees to your employer. Don't give him trouble, her trouble. Don't bother them. Take away their problems from them and you will become a great employee. If you believe that something that you're doing has a problem, before you go to your employer with the problem, already have a solution penned out. Tell them the problem, but be ready with the potential solution, the way you could fix it. And you will be profitable to your employer. And you're going to find, if you're not noticed by that employer, you're going to be noticed by an entrepreneurial employee. What do I mean by that? 
an employee of that employer who has aspirations to run their own business. They're always there. They will see you working and what's going to happen? They call it headhunting. You get headhunted from them or you'll be heard of by other businesses. I don't want to get into all of that. It's, it's all... Anyway, you get the point, yeah? When you are doing the things that you are created to do, especially the things for God, you profit when you exercise your work faithfully. When you, I've spoken about it before. When you give of your best, not your worst. When you give of the highest volume, highest quality of things, not the least. This is the wonderful blessing that you receive. Everything that you do is a manifestation of your love for the Lord. All you do is a true... And now, this has a, both a positive and a negative. Because all that you do is a reflection... And, ex- and, a, and an expression of your love for Jesus. When it's faithful, you and those around you profit. When it is unfaithful, both you and those around you suffer loss. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, you might be able to see how this presents itself there. Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll have a look at verse 5 to 9. This is how we are to live our lives. This is how we are to undertake all of our work. We are to do it as unto the Lord. Everything that we give, we are to give as unto the Lord. All our effort, all our time, all our resources. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. It says there in verse 5, Servants, servants, that's, that's those of us who are gainfully employed, as servants. It speaks about, it speaks about masters too, it speaks about the, the owners of the businesses, those who we serve. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Notice that? Have you, you ever thought about that? The work that you do? You think you're only shuffling paper? Imagine if you were shuffling paper for the Lord. Would that have a different thought within your mind on how well you shuffle that paper? I reckon I could shuffle that paper pretty well. I can stack it up really nice and neat, perfectly folded. I could do it really well if it's unto the Lord. Well, this is what they're telling us. Do it to your masters as unto the Lord. And it goes on, it says, not with eye service as men pleases. In other words, you're not doing it just to be seen of men. You're doing it unto the Lord. Even if you were working for a blind master, God would see it and reward you accordingly. But as the servants of Christ, so not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings. So now it's drawing our attention to the masters, to to the employers, to the ones who pay the servants. Your masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there any respect of persons with him. So the employer is not seen as in a greater position than the employee in the eyes of the Lord. Could you imagine that? The slave working for the slave handler, the slave in the eyes of God could be lifted up and exalted rather than the slave handler. It is certain that when we undertake to manifest the Spirit of God to those around us, we profit and so too those that we serve. Two chapters earlier than our passage, the Apostle wrote simply this, 1 Corinthians 10.31, he said, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. What a wonderful blessing that is. So, how do you fulfill your obligations at work? Do you do your bare minimum so you can just get through the day, you get your wages and you go home? Or do you go the extra mile as we are commanded to do? Are you profitable or have you only done that which was your duty to do? That's a good question to ask ourselves. How do you regard your brethren at church? Well, that's an important one. Think about that for a second. How do you regard your brethren at church? When you bring food, do you bring that which is best or that which is least? 
Is your best expression of the Lord Jesus Christ a not quite right food store? Or is it one that is an example of all Jesus gave to you? Beloved, the Lord love the Lord loves you and he gave himself for you. Our expression of love needs to manifest that. We need to be in evidence of that. We are to manifest the spirit of God, especially that between brethren. How do you as brethren evidence that love between each other? With all that which God has given you, do you help advance the work done in and through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with pocket change that you've got left over or with your first fruits? Are you going to be known eternally for muzzling the ox as he treads out the corn? That's an incredible thought to think about. That how you express your love to the Lord Jesus Christ through the brethren and through the church is going to be known eternally. It's going to be known eternally. The Lord speaks about those things that are done in secret. He'll reveal to all. Are you going to be known that way? Is that gospel hindered or helped by you? Do you pray for your brethren and for souls to be saved? Or is your provision for advancing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross an expression of the abundance of eternal life that He gave you while you were yet an enemy? How well do you express the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you do? Especially with regards to your, your brethren. We profit with all when we give of our all because there is one person who sees that which we do in secret and will one day reward openly. Others profit from our manifesting of the gifts of God. Everything that He's given us, others also profit from our expression of that wonderful gift in ways that you can never imagine. Can I tell you one story? Anybody heard of a man by the name of Edward Kimball? That's not a name, that's not a... Who knows that name? Edward Kimball. Sounds like a pretty plain name, don't you think? It's like Eddie Judetti. Now, that's a pretty boring, plain name. You know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean much of anything. Edward Kimball. Hang on. Anybody heard of D.L. Moody? Yeah. Anybody heard of Billy Sunday? Anybody heard of Billy Graham? Let me tell you about Edward Kimball then. Edward Kimball was just a normal Christian Sunday school teacher who, on a weekly morning in 1856, nervously shared the gospel to a teenage boy who attended his Sunday school class and who was working as a simple sales clerk in his uncle's shoe store. The teenage boy was Dwight Lyman Moody, who became the greatest evangelist of his time. Well, in 1879, the Lord had called D.L. Moody to some evangelism in England, which greatly affected a man by the name of Frederick Meyer. Anybody ever heard of Frederick Meyer? Those of you who have done some studies and done some reading would know of F.B. Meyer, the same man that had the great influence in the Welsh revival in the early 1900s. So here's D.L. Moody affecting F.B. Meyer, who also affected the Welsh revival in the early 1900s. It doesn't stop there. Years later, while Meyer was preaching on an, an American college campus, a student named J. Wilbur Chapman professed faith in Christ. Chapman went to hold an evangelistic meeting across America and later he hired a new convert and former Major League Baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday to work in his ministry. Chapman went on to be a pastor. Billy Sunday went on to carry on the work of evangelism across the United States. Years later, sorry, in 1924, Billy Sunday preached in Charlotte, North Carolina. After the meetings, about 30 men came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that time, they, they formed the Charlotte's Men's Club, which met on a regular basis for prayer. Ten years later, the club met for a day of prayer and fasting in the grove of trees at a man by the name of Frank Graham's dairy farm. It was in his dairy farm. Frank Graham was, yes, the father of Billy Graham. Billy Graham became an answer to prayer of one of the men of that group by the name of Vernon Patterson. Billy Graham went on to preach the gospel to more people in one lifetime than any other evangelist in history. Billy Graham still holds the record for the largest crowd at the MCG. No, 100,024 people is not the record. Billy Graham's record is estimated at 143,000 people 
before we had the ex additional stands that we've got today. Pretty incredible, isn't it? So the greatest crowd at the MCG, a sporting arena that idolises man, was an evangelistic crusade speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, because Edward Kimball loved Jesus more than he feared man, he profited with eternal reward. And the world profited by the ministries of D.L. Moody, Wilbur Chapman, F.B. Mayer, Billy Sunday, Mordecai Ham, Billy Graham, and millions of other men and women that the world has never heard of. You see, you don't think of yourself very highly and you don't think of the work that you would undertake as tremendous and yet all it takes is one person. You share the gospel with one person, who knows who that person would be? And yet you receive the reward of that. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And you and others are profiting with regards to how you manifest the Spirit of God in all that you do. How do you do it? Are you challenged by it? Is it something that you should consider? The last point here is to one is given. The last point? Yeah, it's the last point. Second last point. Shorter one. Okay. The one is given. This is the manifestation of the, the different gifts. In the text it tells us to the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It goes on in verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You'll notice something really interesting. It's not all those gifts given to one person. It's one given to one and another given to another, another given to another. When you go into some of these charismatic churches, they all seem to claim that you're not born again unless you can speak in tongues. Well, the Bible actually says that not everybody is given that gift. Then he goes on and says, does everybody speak in tongues? And he's clearly expecting the answer to be no. Does everybody interpret? Well, clearly the answer is no. And this is back then, this is not least of which is that these are relative, revelatory gifts that would have an end. What we see here is a distribution of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, and every man to express those gifts in accord with the Spirit of God, whose fundamental and express purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. John sixteen fourteen. Paul tells us at the end of this chapter, that the entirety of chapter 13 has the greatest expression of each of those gifts as love, and particularly love between brethren. Everything Paul's dealing with here with regards to the church at Corinth is one of rebuke. And he's doing that in, to the Corinthian church. It's of rebuke. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I don't find it often curious how the Bible in the epistles seems to be structured that way. For doctrine, the book of Romans. For rebuke, the Corinthian epistles. For correction, Galatians. For instruction in righteousness, Ephesians. And then it starts again. I find it very interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but it seems to have that sort of a structure. That was just a side thing. You can play with that if you like. But the interesting thing is, is that's what we have here. We're a worldly church and we can be a worldly church. We can be given over to worldly things. And Paul is speaking here about those that are given over to this particular expression of a particular gift. It is an exaggerated expression and we know it as the gift of tongues. Chapters 12, 13 and 14, he's dealing with this. And, he refer, and it's referred to here as an, a revelatory gift. 1 Corinthians 13.3. Take a look there with me just for a moment. We already spoke about those gifts and the, the wonderful blessing of charity and how it works. But it's verse 8 that we find an interesting phrase. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 and this is the reason why we claim within our statement of faith that the revelatory gifts have ceased. Verse 8 says, charity never faileth. 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. It's always been understood that the purpose of tongues is to reveal the Word of God. That the purpose of prophecy. Now the word prophecy has two different renderings in the Scriptures, so you need to be able to pick that where it turns up. Sometimes the word prophecy refers to the foretelling of an event yet future, right? But it often also has a picture of teaching. Prophesying is speaking out the Word of God, teaching the Scriptures, and then words of knowledge, which is also related to the Word of God. Now what we have is, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. All those revelatory gifts were related directly to the Word of God. The Word of God, we understood that during the time of the Corinthian church, had not been circulating as a complete New Testament. Matter of fact, it wouldn't be for at least another five decades. So when that which is perfect is come refers to the, the Bible, the Word of God, the New Testament completed, perfect. There's no more need for the revelatory gifts if we already have the full communication of God to His people, to His church. Does that make sense? That's where that comes from and that's where we know that that which is perfect is not referring to Jesus Christ coming from heaven. These are revelatory gifts to teach and to encourage and to build up the church. Well, that which is perfect can only be the New Testament and its conclusion. And the New Testament had not been fulfilled or completed at that time. It wouldn't be completed until John's revelation, which would be roughly around about 100 AD, so sometime after this. This is what we see, beloved, this is what we see. The gift of tongues was given to preach the wonderful works of God. It was to glorify Jesus Christ in love. It was never the purpose of the gift to be an end in itself. We're dealing with the, with, with the tongues here, the manifestation that's happening in these days, in these last days. It's never to be a purpose in and of itself. It was never intended to be permanent either. Not the true gift of tongues. It was given before the Word of God was completed in history. Now, the important thing is, the babbling that we're seeing today is not the gift of tongues that is seen in the first century church. Anybody know what the difference is? Sorry? It's interesting because Paul refers to it as unknown tongue. You only get that in the King James, by the way. You don't get that in modern translations. So every time the word tongue is in the singular, Paul refers to it as the unknown tongue. Okay? When it's in the plural, it's tongues and it's languages. Language. Do you know the word language comes from? It comes from the Latin lingua, tongue. It's tongue. When you're speaking in a tongue, you're speaking with your tongue, you're speaking in a language. Right? The word language comes from the tongue, the word tongue. It's exactly the same, right? That's where we get it from. So it refers to languages. When it's multiple, then it's referring to known languages. When it's singular, it's referring to an unknown tongue. Beloved, there is only one form of babble. It's anything that's incomprehensible is an unknown tongue. Okay, it's what's referred to, we refer to that as babble. Have a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that you might be able to see how Paul is dealing with this and then ask yourself why on earth the modern churches aren't seeing this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll read from verse 6. He writes there and he says, Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? Oh, is this difficult to understand? Beloved, is this difficult to understand? Is this hard to comprehend? If it's difficult to... If you can't discern the words, then the words are useless. They have no value. Not for the exhortation and the encouragement and edifying of the church. He goes on here, though. 
He says, for you shall speak unto the air. Who are you speaking to? You think Paul is being nice about this? I think he's being pretty objective. There are, verse 10, it may, see, it may be so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, see that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. This particular manifestation of tongues was not edifying to the church, it was edifying to themselves. The whole purpose of the gifts of God is to be edifying to the church. What's that mean? It means to love the brethren, is to build up the brethren, to support the brethren. The manifestation of the Spirit of God is charity, that is love between brethren. The thing that he's dealing with here is an, an exaggerated use of a gift that is not doing anything to demonstrate love to the brethren. It's drawing attention to the self. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever, ever seen an entire church babbling away? I've been there. I've been there. I was a part of a church like that. He goes on elsewhere and he says, when a person comes in and they see you all speaking like this, won't they think that you're mad? Won't they think that you're mad? Well, that was a revelation when I, because I'm sitting there thinking these people are mad. And all of a sudden I read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It just confirmed to me that they're mad and it was time for me to go. You know, it's incredible how simple this is. Why do they manifest it? Well, they manifest it because of the warm fuzzies that come. There are warm fuzzies. I know, I've done it before. And when you sit there exhaling with nothing but vowels, it's warm fuzzies. You know, you get these really fuzzy feelings and you think that those fuzzy feelings, they feel so nice, they must therefore be true. No, no. You get the same warm fuzzies when you're listening to some godless music sometimes. It puts you into an, into an altered state of consciousness and that's what these people are doing. They're entering into an altered state of consciousness. It's not good for them at all. It's not manifesting the truth of God and it's certainly not demonstrating love to the brethren. It's self-exalting. It's self-edifying. It's not edifying to the church. Born again believers differ in the gifts that are given to them and the same revelatory gifts that are peculiar gifts to the individuals would pass, they would cease and the only one that remains is the one that manifests the Spirit of God to glorify Jesus, that is the best gifts remain. And last point this morning, the most excellent way. Lest we be too far diverted from our task, we must remember that what we're dealing with is the nature of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, His nature related to the Lord Jesus Christ. How the Spirit of God was to ultimately manifest and glorify Jesus. It is through your love. Your love, one toward another. Giving your best one toward another. Not your worst. Not your worst. In everything that you do, the things that you provide for the church is a blessing. To bless the brethren. The things that you bring to maybe a Bible study, the same thing. It is to be a blessing, it is to be the best, not the worst. The how we act one with another, we are to do our best. Beloved, I'm not speaking to you here as one that's perfect in this. Please, you, you understand that, yeah? Those of you who know me well enough know that I, I, I'm not great at this. But it is definitely, definitely that which manifests the Spirit of God to the people that are around us. This is the best. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and that I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. I love verse 3 in that passage. It says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Interesting choice of words, I think. It profiteth me nothing. So in other words, again, the manifestation of the Spirit of God through charity is there to profit with all. It profits you as well as others. It profits you as well as others. If you don't have love in contending to these things, there is no profit to you directly. 
This is a love that is between brethren. How are you demonstrating the manifestation of the Spirit in your life? It is certain that you are evidencing something. That there's no question. We're all evidencing something. But to what extent is it charity? Does God see you giving your best or your least? Does He see you? It's one of the things that I often, you know, I, I, I write sermons every single week, right? And there's a lot of the times I, I find myself struggling with time. There's things that go on in the week that, that make me struggle with time. And there's times that I feel like, you know, I, maybe I could, well, actually, the thoughts very rarely come to my mind, but the thought of winging it, you know? Is it, I don't know, has that ever happened to you? you know, ah, thought of winging it and I can't go through with it. I can't go through with it because I, I think to myself, if, if that's the best that I can do, then the, the brethren aren't going to profit. I'm, I'm here for your profit, not, not for mine, I'm here for yours and if, and if all I do is wing it and I give you the least, how is it going to profit you? And I, so I just can't do it. I, I, I find myself, if I don't put in the work that needs to be put in, I can't expect the Lord to bless. Now, beloved, I've been in situations before when I didn't even have my notes. They were gone. They didn't turn up in my thing or I forgot to put them when I was using paper notes in the past. And the only thing that I had in my head, and that's why sometimes the, the outline points that I have are, are fairly, they're fairly close in resembling one another. Not this week's one so much, but this week's one's yes to a degree because it it, it, it presents a verse, just a passage, right? So it's easy to remember. But they're designed to be, make sure that I remember because there's a time that I'd actually forgotten my notes completely and there was no way known I had the time to go back and get them. And I actually preached just from my outline. And because I knew that I put in the work, God blessed it, you know? Because I knew that I put in the work. But this is the same with you, beloved. It's the same for you. When you are willing to give your best to the Lord and to the things of God and for the sake of the brethren, God blesses you. Your conscience is clear that you've given your best and not your least. You've given of your first fruits, not your leftovers. And I'm not just speaking about money, speaking about time as well. Your time to be given to the Lord should be your first fruits, not the time that you've got left over. Not that. That's your least. We are to give our best. Do you prioritise your time for others or for yourself? Do you prioritise your time more for others or for yourself? Ladies, the time that you spend in the mirror, is it more for you or for others? You know, it's exactly the same. You know, men, you're the same. You spend more time in your garage, your workshop, you spend more time... You know, hanging around with your mates than you are edifying and building up your family. Men have got a habit of doing that. We definitely have a habit of doing that. Where are we giving our best? Where are we giving our best? Do you give only in order to receive? There's another one. Do you give only in order to receive? I'm trying to show that person love, but I'm not getting anything back in return. You know, what's your motivation there? Ask yourself the question with regards to that. You know, I did this for you, this for you, this for you, this for you. How many of you got a checklist? My wife has one that goes back 25 years. <laughs> uh, you know, just, we're supposed to... God has cast my sins as far as the east is from the west, but my wife hasn't. <laughs> and I don't know how they get the memory. I can't remember yesterday. You know, they remember things. That, you know, 10 years ago when you said... I don't know. I can't remember that. <laughs> do you give only in order to receive or do you give because your desire is not for eye service as men pleases, but your desire is to please the Lord? Beloved, you know, when your desire is only to please the Lord, do you know the work that you're willing to do and capable of doing? When you remember that you're only here to please Him, and you're not here to please you, and yet in pleasing Him, it pleases you. I tell you, it's the most wonderful joy in the world, the most wonderful blessing in the world, to be able to give for His work, to be spent for His work. You get exhausted. I'm not saying that you don't get exhausted. You need your rest. 
All of that's true because we're still flesh, right? We haven't got our glorified bodies yet. So take that into account. You do need to rest. You do need time out. But everything that you do, we do for the Lord because we're expressing our love to our brethren because that's the same love that we've received from Christ. This is that charity. This is that love in in action. How did Jesus manifest his love for you? The greatest manifestation of the Spirit of God that should grow in your life is charity. Love between brethren. That's the greatest manifestation of love. Of love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The Lord is coming soon. And when he comes, all opportunity to profit eternally will be over. Will be over. Edward Kimball may indeed lay claim to an eternal reward he never expected. All he did was manifest the gift of love that was given him. And so can you. So can you. God bless you and Maranatha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, your blessing to us, your challenge in our lives, your work within us, dear Lord. I pray that you would glorify your name through us. Challenge our hearts, dear Lord. Help us know, dear Father, and remember where our treasures are to be laid. And help us, dear Father, to give all that we can to you. The brethren, dear Lord, in the first century pooled all their resources together for the blessing of one for another, that no man had lack and no man had more than he needed. And I pray to you, dear Lord, and ask you, Father, that our own mentality may be similar to this, that we would be a blessing one to another, that we would glorify your name, that we would give all that we can for the work of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, dear Father, Work your work within our hearts that charity may be the evident way that we manifest the Spirit of God towards each other. We give you thanks for this time and your blessing to us in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.